So we're at Bridge Pottery with Mickey Sloshink. I'm going to hear a little about um, Mickey's work, life and practice. So your home and your vocation are here at Bridge Pottery, which were established in 1987. So it now comprises studio space, kiln room, beautiful gallery made from local art, clay room and wonderful outdoor spaces. An incredibly dynamic and peaceful place to be. <laughs> Is it something that has been long in the planning or that has evolved and grown organically over the years? Yeah, I would say very much grown organically. Often quite suddenly and spontaneously little bits will evolve. One other big thing is that what we've done to the studio, that was a big change about five years ago, I think. I think maybe I have ideas in my mind for a while... So they're kind of quite slow for ideas to grow, and then suddenly it's the time. I do remember having feeling for many, many years a little bit unsettled here because we hadn't really moved here with the intention of settling here. It was actually like um, a pause. So I basically made a huge commitment to make it work mm. here. Mm. Yeah. So then it was exciting, then once I'd made that decision... And then you know, contacted a, a very, one of my best friends, an architect. So I said, you know, who, if you were building something, who would you advise? And she, her favourite architect was David Lee. So I contacted him. And I had you know, quite a limited budget, but I said, you know, what can we do for this? So he came up with this very good, very simple design. Um, it was very into green materials, so green lo and local materials. I was meant to be writing a book on salt because I had actually got commissioned to write this book. So I decided that I would travel for a little period, go to America and Australia. I was doing that time more teaching, going abroad quite a bit. And I thought, well, I'll make a trip and do a survey of wood and wood salt kilns to decide on my next kiln, what shall I build? So I but allowed myself to do the trip anyway. And that was really good because I, I felt much more at ease, enjoyed the trip, um, made very good connections with wood fire potters in Australia, America. And then luckily this American, young American potter who had just finished a kind of apprenticeship got in touch. He needed, he wanted a place to work for a, a short period and was very keen on wood firing. And I said, are you good at wood building kilns? He said, yes. I said, okay, come. And he turned out to be just a fantastically good, good person. And... Um, helped me to build the kiln, along with this Danish student who happened to want to sort of want some work that summer. So we built it quite intensely, quite quickly, in about six weeks. And during the process of building it, I was sort of changing the design all the time. And it kept kind of evolving. And whilst we were building it, I suddenly decided to extend the firebox, double the size of the firebox, so that I could have that space for the front chamber parts. Yeah. So slowly, 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 that's progressing you seem very open to creative conversations and explorations. And I know individual potters and other creatives who come and draw succour from yourself and from Bridge Pottery. And many um, of the developments have maybe been led by yourself, but with influence from others and collaboration. Mm -hmm. is, is that always been mm -hmm. important to the way... Well, I think it has kind of... It's kind of come about as a sort of phase of life. You know, when I talk now to you, it's yeah. to do with um, when my whole family situation changed, when the children had grown up. To run a pottery on your own, especially a wood fire pottery, daunting, mm. Mm. really daunting. Often feel like I need help. And, and I think I like, I like the energy of having other people around, friends, and we become a kind of little community of people who have sort of passed through here, but we still feel quite, I tend to stay quite connected. Mm. People come back at periods, who people come and go a little bit. So I guess it's a way to stay, without very being very intentional about it, that's sort of what's happened. It wasn't really a big plan. No, no. no. But the <laughs> it sort of happened. And the vitality yeah. of that certainly feeds into your, into your work. Um, seeing you throwing few different forms earlier I have to say and this is not but it feels as or it seemed as if 
the form sort of grew out of you, I have to say. It was such <laughs> natural ease that you were throwing on the wheel. Um, and I know you stated a wonderful aim, to, which is to make pots that grow on those who use them, which is just such a wonderful idea and notion. So your thinking behind that is very much to make for the everyday and of the everyday and of of you really <laughs> so I mean I don't see myself as a um, you know I was sort of trained at the time of the production potter and, a, and making sort of series of tableware but I'm much more drawn to forms that are slightly in between slightly elusive people don't quite know what it is um, so that they can have their imagination or it can evoke what's the word not evoke but trigger their imagination into how would they use, you know, how would they like to use this object, this pot. So it suggests use, but does not sort of define it. Mm. I don't, I'm not a very defined person. The, the form needs to be strong and clear, but inviting. I wish I had the courage to, to make more marks, because I think I want to, but I'm still a bit shy. So I look forward to the next ten years. I hope I'll get braver. <laughs> I like to make very simple drawings, so I started to do small drawings on tiles. I can just about allow that. But I, was, I started to think about, could I allow myself a little small drawing on a, on a pot, you know? Um, so that's what I have in mind. So it's something about writing on clay that I find very um, intriguing, very drawing in, draws mm. me in. And I'm not sure where that'll go. I'm just sort of conscious of that sort of murmuring away. Mm. You throw. You also hand build. Mm. Would you say there's a particular technique or form, actually, that you particularly enjoy making? The form I probably most like to throw is, is the bowl. You know how people seem to be slightly divided between people who are, who are more drawn to a kind of open bowl shape or the ones who are more drawn to tall cylindrical shapes and I've always, I'm definitely a sort of bowl, bowl person and there, there seems to be huge scope in that, all the different kind of forms of bowl but that's usually on the wheel I would say, that I like to make bowls um, with my hand building, like the spoons, they feel very much like they come from this comes from a place of sort of, how can they come from a different place? I mean, something to do with hand buildings, I think the emotional connection is almost more direct. Mm -hmm. Because with the throwing, this, there is this skill and there's this falling back on training and skill and all the things you know about how the pots need to be, mm -hmm. to be well made. Whereas for me, there's a little bit more freedom, I think, in the hand building. There's less um, rules about how it has to be done. So it's an area for more for sort of self-expression and exploration or something like that. But again, it's an area where, like with the mark making, that I haven't given enough time to in my life. I'm aware that you take quite a lot of notes during the process of making. Is that something you do throughout the whole process and I'm refer happy to...? i to show you the story. So when I'm on the making day, I have this little notebook... So I will write down the weight of the clay, what the clay is, roughly the measurements, or, or more precisely, the measurements, where, which part of the kiln it's going. So I'm always thinking of where they're going in the kiln. And then when I come back to slipping them, that might be two days later or something, I'll come back and write the notes here. Then after the firing, I'll come back and make notes in a different pen as to how they worked out. This notebook is, is one that I, have, that I kind of try to keep with me I do have a lot of fear of losing num losing my ideas, so I try to keep this close-ish to me. There we are. So that's that notebook. And then I have... Um, this is the kiln firing book. When we started to unpack it, this is from the west and this is the east. So I do a quick, quick drawing. So I see... And the most important thing about it is actually the measurements of the... What's, what height the shelves were and the airspace above it, space that I've given to the pots above, because that is what determines so much of the salt and the flame path. If I've left too much space, they might get over-salted. 
too little space they're under sorted so I've got worse in my old age I've got more and more detailed with my notes you know so in your finished pieces I mean they're bursting with rich tones and hues and I know you use some slips mm -hmm. and some oxides but then there's obviously the flames the wood ash the salt vapor but can you tell us a little bit more about um, how you de how you decide which forms might be sort of coloured in which way and how which forms might sit where in the kiln because of that? It's huge. <laughs> right. Well, you covered most of There was one critical thing that you didn't mention, and that was the clay body. Because first of all, the clay body gives you the tone. So the basic body that I use for quite a lot of the work in the main chamber is this clay from Saint Amand, and it's called, so it's called Terre de Saint Amand, the clay from Saint Amand, which is this region in the centre of France. And it's a clay that's been used for centuries, or for, maybe not centuries, but for a long time, for wood-fired salt clays. So it has like something like one and a half percent of iron in it, mm. um, and it's quite a plastic clay, but the balance of the materials in it make it take the salt well, so it responds well to both salt and ash, but it has, because it's got iron in it, it's quite a darkish tone. So, um, that, if you, you, I kind of think of that as being the underneath, that, that's my kind of base palette, and then on top of that I'll be putting slips that either lighten or darken, or bring this range of colours. So I think my, my kind of um, default slip is the slip that I've sort of is and the colours are the kind of reds and oranges, the fiery colours, um, sort of the colours of India. When I went to India when I was 19, I had no uh, concept of, of such thing existing as a potter. I'd never come across a potter, I knew nothing, didn't really <coughs> look at pots particularly. But when I got to India, I saw everywhere on the side of the road, in markets, huge piles of these beautiful kind of water jars and different shaped pots, all in this terracotta red, which was the same colour exactly as the soil. So I think in some ways that resonance, that kind of being drawn to that warmth and fire, warmth and fiery earth. So I, there's something about, I do like the colours of the traditional country earthenware pots, which are kind of beautiful reds, and then with a the white slip they had that, warm yellow, those yellows and reds. So over the years I've sort of just been constantly adapting and testing them. And you touched on it earlier when you talked about the packing of the kiln, yeah. which is such a science really, yes, to the really. packing of the kiln, yeah. and about conduct, not conducting maybe, channeling the, the flame. flames and yes. channeling. That's right, so that how you, the position of the pots, how they are in relation to each other, you know that putting one pot in front of another is creating, um, it's protecting the beh pot behind it, so the part that's exposed to the flame will get very strong, one colour, and the part that's protected is very strongly another colour. Oh, that's particularly in the front chamber you get that. In the main chamber, the, there's a little bit more movement, because the salt, I think, moves around the pots more, more than just the flame itself and the wood ash. The wood ash in the main part of the chamber is affecting more of the pots on the edge, mm. so it's not getting right through to the back whereas the salt goes through the whole of that chamber, so it disperses more evenly. In terms of wood firing mm. and salt glazing, it sounds like wood firing was a very early yeah. influence, or had took early effect. Commitment. Commit yes. Yeah, I think, um, well, it started with when I was at college, and we, well, I was at Harrow, and during the first summer we um, were meant to go and work at a pottery, and I had come across this pot in the first pottery I worked in in Ireland, I'd come across a pot that I'd sort of fallen in love with, mm. <laughs> seriously fallen in love with, this little one little pot that was on my windowsill of the room that I slept in. And it was, I didn't know it at the time, but it was wood-fired and it was salt glazed. And I developed a passion for this pot. So that when it, we had to find a, a, a pottery to work in, luckily the potter used to write his name, he had his name on the bottom and it was Tifosh. So I found where this potter was in Brittany turned up at his doorstep and said, can I help you this summer? And he was a really lovely, lovely man who was sort of 
he met the head. He's quite a successful little pottery and making tableware, which was quite in demand at that time, but also had a wood salt kiln, which he used more for his sculptural pieces. He was very into kind of nautical shapes because he had been a ship or boat engineer before this. He agreed to have me for the summer, and it was a really good experience because I got the kind of work ethic there. We start at 8, we finish at 12, we have lunch and a two-hour break, 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and I really you know, got the practice of what it's like to be in a practice proper workshop. Um, and I got to put some pots in his kiln. So when I went back to Harrow to the, for the second year, I immediately built a small wood, fire, a wood kiln and then fired most of my work in that kiln because I already knew that's what I wanted to do. I mean, we actually only managed one wood firing because we had difficulty in getting enough wood. Mm. So I had to adapt it whilst I was at college to, into being an oil-fired kiln. But it was, that was just to, to be able to manage. But So that when I started my first... Um, I set up my first pro big pottery that was in Yorkshire in 1974. I built a large wood firing, wood salt kiln with the help of this guy, T. Fosh. He came over with his family. So I was committed very quickly. Mm. This feels like such a big field to me that, you know, I know one lifetime isn't enough. 